Now, you, you came from Texas Public Policy Foundation. And, uh, you know, I learned in the years that I've been kind of discovering the conservative movement over the last years, you know, I, I found Texas Public Policy Foundation to be, I don't know, one of the most active groups that I, that I come across or like impactful in terms of, you know, crafting state policy and, and so forth. I guess I'm wondering how much that your, your tenure there impacted what you're doing now. Uh, greatly. And, you know, when I got to Texas Public Policy Foundation, it already had the reputation of being a do tank before being a think tank. And I think that reality plus my experience in, in running an institution of higher education, starting my own school, kind of having a, an entrepreneurial background in the, in the education world, has created, at least from my perspective, a need for every nonprofit leader in the policy space to be worried about more than just writing white papers. The papers are important. You know, we've, we've spent some time talking about the China paper. The reason they're important is because they're the foundation on which the rest of our work rests. But the distinguished thing, distinguishing thing about heritage is the same distinguishing characteristic about Texas Public Policy Foundation. And that is that every word we write in one of those papers is oriented around policy change. And, and that, unfortunately, inside Washington, D.C., that action is really uncommon. And so what we're hoping at Heritage is not just for we ourselves to be successful with our own policy prescriptions, but to inspire some of the other policy organizations headquartered in DC on the political right to do the same. The, the, the biggest complaints I hear about what goes on in that building behind you is you know, a lot of inaction, a lot of uh, avoidance of responsibility. Maybe if I do something, someone might not like it, so it's just better not to do anything. I've actually heard that from so many people over the years. It's actually kind of unbelievable. Um, there's also this whole question of whether Congress has ceded a lot of its authority, um, you know, into the agencies. Some years ago, you would say the word deep state and everyone would laugh. Ah, oh, what, what, what are you talking about? Now everyone's like, oh, wow, there's something very deep in this state. <laughs> I don't know if they're thinking that in those words exactly, but you know what I'm saying. I do. Right? There, the two things. The first is there is a lot of risk aversion inside the United States Capitol. And if, if Alexis de Tocqueville were here almost 200 years after he visited the United States, he wouldn't be surprised because... He observed that politicians and republics and democracies, constitutional monarchies, always suffered from a certain amount of political cowardice. And it was incumbent upon the people, their constituents, to uh, buck them up, we might say, help them grow a spine. The result of that, to your point about the deep state, point number two, is that the deep state, the administrative state more broadly, is the rotten fruit of our individual members of Congress, our two senators from our, each of our respective states, not taking the, the courage, not having the courage to pass bills or kill bills on behalf of self-governance. And so this is precisely why Heritage, along with 54 other conservative organizations, 400 policy scholars, has been working so intently on Project 2025, the aim of which is to take the, the biggest dagger ever and place it firmly in the center of the heart of the deep state. When we do that, not if, when we do that, not only will we see the demise of the deep state, but we'll also see members of Congress be inspired to do their jobs. What do you think right now? Because I've, I've heard, oh wow, Congress is now taking its oversight more seriously. There's this subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government. There's multiple committees focused on China. Um, uh, at the same time, I, I am seeing some, you know, somewhat compelling opinions saying, hey, you know, these guys look like they might just be spinning their wheels. Is there really ha anything happening? What do you think? I think it took a while for them, the members of Congress uh, of the House, to get all of their staffs together. It took a little bit longer than I think it should have. But as we sit here, I can report that they're largely staffed up and, and they've always had the intention of of doing their business, it sort of goes back to the, the point that I made about heritage always being in a hurry and, and understanding the urgency of the moment. It's also why a year ago, Heritage started our oversight project, which is designed to provide the ammunition and to some extent the personnel 
that those committees you mentioned need in order to do their jobs. I'm, I'm really happy as we sit in the middle of spring in 2023 that there's finally some momentum there. And it's really important as we move forward that those committees focus on the right topics of investigation and pair those with good legislation. Legislation, for example, on the debt ceiling. Legislation, for example, on border security. In other words, it can't just be about the investigations. There's some injustice that needs to, to, to be addressed. Obviously, Heritage is, is investing in that. But we also know from the time we spend outside DC, which is most of the hours in, in my week, that people are looking for an aspirational vision for the future. So we've got to pair the, the redressing of, of grievances with what we're going to do when we're fully in power in a couple of years. Well, it's redressing grievances, but also just kind of having some kind of accountability, right, to all, all sorts of things which seem to have gone egregiously wrong. You know, to, the Twitter files certainly exposed a lot of that alongside you know, multiple lawsuits which are being run, discovery in those lawsuits saw, has shown all sorts of, well, well activity that shouldn't be happening, <laughs> you know, whether legal or not, right? No, that, that's yeah. right. And, and, and Heritage fully uh, accepts all of that. My concern is that we get so focused on our side of, on the investigations, members of Congress sometimes forget to connect why they're doing that investigation with how it affects the self-governance of the everyday American. And the media does a really good job of driving the wedge between those two things. So it's, it's more of a, of a messaging criticism about American political conservatives, which is that it isn't enough just to do the investigations. You have to constantly explain why you're doing the investigations. It isn't just about the people who are involved in them per se, it's about all of us. There's a, a, a two-tiered system of justice, not just for President Trump, but for all of us. Ask Mark Halk, the, the pro-life activist in Pennsylvania. This is what Heritage brings to the table. On the one hand, the ammunition to conduct the investigations, and then on the other hand, the messaging help to remind Americans why they need to care. It, it really does seem like that, that you know, if you have certain political viewpoints, you can get away with a lot that you wouldn't have been able to get away with in the past. Whereas if you have other political viewpoints, you feel the full weight of the law, even when it's unreasonable for that to be the case, i.e. these, you know, kind of SWAT teams, the FBI SWAT teams being used for, you know, situations where it's just it's kind of preposterous. Well, it's true. And, and as we sit here, do you think that there's much of a chance that any of the political allies of President Biden will have to deal with the 87,000 new IRS agents? Of course not. But those of us at Heritage, people in right of center media outlets, just common sense media outlets that are not mouthpieces for the regime, they have to be worried. That's unconscionable in, in modern America. And so Heritage, all of us at Heritage wake up every day fighting that, looking forward to the day when we can finally fix it. Describe to me the regime that you just mentioned. What is that? There are two elements of it. The figureheads of the regime are Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, but the regime is a, a long running project of, of the political left. It, it really started or, or was, was amplified in the late 60s and early 70s in the, the anti-Vietnam War protest of the academic left. The, the short version of the story is that those people have been in political power for the last couple of decades. They're members of the House, members of the Senate, executives, in the executive branch of the United States. And the reason I insist on calling it a regime is because these people don't believe in small r Republican principles. They don't believe that there is a common good to which they owe a moral obligation as many Republicans and Democrat leaders leading up to this point have. And so Heritage insists on calling it a regime because they're not focused on self-governance. They, they hate what the everyday American stands for you know, we could sit here and, and go through the litany of pejorative ways that Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and Barack Obama have described people like me, gun owners, someone who goes to church. I mean, something as radical as that. They hate us. And we need to be careful not to hate them. Those of us, given our particular faith traditions, shouldn't be filled with hatred. But we do need to be filled with a zeal in the public square to confront them to defeat them and to make sure that they're never in power again. 
there's so many areas um, in American life where things seem to be going wrong. Examples would be, um, you know, all these new uh, rules around how elections are run across many different states, right? That have that have created just as I've understood it, a foundationally different way that, frankly, the whole electoral process is even understood, right? That's one. Another area, similarly, is, uh, uh, is the border, right? There have been an unbelievable number of people, some of which we don't even know, that, that have crossed the border into America. And in some cases, they're even you know, there's laws on the books to have them voting in American elections, to bring it back to elections. So, you know, we, we, we've, we've touched on China, we've touched on a, a bit on oversight. Here's two kind of big elephants in the room, right? If these things aren't somehow dealt with, how, how, how can all of, this, uh, all of these other areas be achieved? Well, okay. the answer to your question is they can't be. So th this is why Heritage has worked so diligently on improving election integrity and, and there a lot of progress to report a lot of lack of progress to report you can go and see our election integrity scorecard and see those states that have legitimately from from objective analysis done a very good job of addressing some problems and and we rate them more highly than others the flip side on elections is that places like pennsylvania and wisconsin and arizona just to name a few will continue to be problems and so the, the, the short version is that when we get into the 2024 election cycle, Americans can be a little more optimistic about the integrity of elections, but we are far from securing all of those problems. On the border, however, there's no progress to report. I mean, you, you know me well, I'm, I'm an op optimist. I try to see the silver lining in every problem. There's no silver lining in this. It is awful. It is one of the worst examples of policy failure by any American president ever. And the reason it's that profound is because it's intentional. It is intentional by the President of the United States and his seemingly incompetent Secretary of Homeland Security, who isn't that incompetent, he's actually very capable at implementing what he's doing, to have two and a half million people, at least two and a half million illegal aliens in this country. It undermines the rule of law. It's probably permanently changed what had been very peaceful, Anglo and Mexican American counties and communities across the border of Texas and Arizona and New Mexico. And further still, as our heritage research has proven, those illegal aliens have arrived in every congressional district in this country. Every county in the United States of America is a border county, which isn't a comment about people who might come here legally. We love immigrants at Heritage. It's a comment that when you allow millions of people to cross illegally, not only are you endangering public safety, you're endangering the rule of law and the very ideals of America. Until and unless we fix that problem, as we were beginning to do in the former administration, America's future is endangered. I keep thinking about what's been dubbed by some the disinformation industrial complex. I love that. Which has you know, grown up let's say over the last seven, seven odd years to the point where there's people, you know, studying in universities to become experts at this thing, right? And there's this effort in our society or there's this moment in our society where some of us, and I'll say us broadly, right, believe that speech should be curtailed, believe that certain beliefs should be amplified you know, massively, and those are the, and these are, this is, you know, go, going back to what I was talking about, this cognitive liberty spectrum, right? That, that there's certain correct beliefs that are acceptable, and there's other ones which need to be hidden and unavailable to, to, to people to even know. And there's this, there's a whole mechanism of manufacturing perceived consensus in society. It's a very powerful, I call it the megaphone. It's a very powerful mechanism and there's multiple organizations involved and the media are just part of it. And there's some portion of our population also that's incredibly susceptible to it and not, not bad people, not morally questionable people in, in, in some cases, in many cases, just easy to influence. First of all, do you agree? If you, if you do, you know, how can we 
have some kind of unity in a society where this megaphone can always create you know, incredible strife through whatever it decides to push through itself. I not only agree, Jan, I, if I have your permission, I'm going to use your phrase, manufacturing perceived consensus, because it, that is so true. And, and, and that largely happens by our legacy media outlets, which are primarily based in New York City and in Washington. And, and the solution to that is for people to spend more time with regular folks outside those cities, but also inside those cities. There are a lot of regular folks in Washington and New York City, right? That is to say, watch Epoch Times, read the Epoch Times paper, but be very selective after that with the news, the national news that we're consuming and take whatever time you're saving by no longer consuming that news and spend it with everyday people. It's, it's why, as, as my staff at Heritage know, when I'm outside DC, which is most of the time, whether I'm, I'm in home in, in Virginia or traveling on behalf of Heritage, I always stop in a McDonald's, I always stop in a convenience store. I don't care the neighborhood. I don't care if I kind of look out of place as a middle-aged bald white guy. Those are my fellow Americans. And you can be engaged in a conversation. You know, my wife would say that she learns more about politics by being in the produce aisle at the local grocery store than she does reading most outlets. She's a huge fan, of course, of Epoch Times. But the, the point is, we should not give those people who want to use a megaphone to, to get us to, to stop thinking what we do about self-governance, the power that they have. And the only way to do that is to be a lot more intentional with the news that we consume and to be really focused on spending greater time in community. But then that still begs the question, how then do you establish unity? Well, for more than 200 years, that's how Americans consume their news and there was a certain unity about that. Why? Because it, it's just scientifically, biologically obvious that humans have many things in common. And one of the things that we're, we're hardwired to do, especially in American history, is to love our country. And the reason that we want to do that is because we love our neighbor. Isn't it interesting that these people who are manufacturing perceived consensus emphasize what divides us, what causes us to be suspicious of our neighbor? That's not what it means to be an American. So stop consuming news that says that. So this ideology uh, that's become dominant in, frankly, just about every set of institutions in the country. We could call it woke. We could call it critical social justice. I think that's the kind of official, official what it calls itself. Um, this is something that Heritage is, I know, you know, looking at very deliberately. So what, what, what is your work around this? Well, I think what my policy scholar colleagues at Heritage do well, regardless of the policy arena, but in this case, and particularly confronting critical theory, is go to the root cause of the problem. And so we can talk about critical race theory. My good friend, Mike Gonzalez, is perhaps the, the leading critic of that. But the reason Mike is persuasive about that isn't just about critical race theory per se, but he goes to the origins of the ideology, which is critical theory, something that as a young history graduate student, I had to learn. So it surprises some people to know that the president of the Heritage Foundation is well-schooled in critical theory. It's what he had to do to get through some liberal graduate departments in history, and it didn't affect me. But the root of that is, is anti-human. They are Marxist in their origins. And I don't mean that to be name-calling. Conservatives need to be better that when we use the word Marxist, we actually know what we're saying. To be Marxist is to reduce people to their immutable characteristics, their skin color, where they live, you know, living in a certain part of the, country, of the world or another. And critical theory, therefore, doesn't understand someone's soul. It is no place if someone happens to be agnostic or even atheist, the role of nature. There's nothing about these theories that would signify that people can ever live harmoniously in a community with people who don't look like them. Well, or are the same class, I think. That's are the, the same class, right. that's, that's exactly that's, right. Because that's the, that, that's, that's the original way we think about that's right. Marxism, right? So there has to be complete unanimity, socioeconomically, ethnically, culturally, I would say religiously, but there's no room in Marxism for religion. Right, so it's uniformity across uh, kind of an atheist 
And to come full circle in our conversation, there's nothing transcendent. And when there's nothing transcendent for a human person, that's an awful quality of life, which is why all of the advocates of critical theory I know are miserable people. Over the coming years, you know, you, you have this plan that you seem to have, you know, enacted pretty quickly, pretty deliberately with some, you know, fr fruits of, of that labor already. Um, what are your most important directions right now? And, and also you personally, which ones are you focusing on? Within Project 2025? Within the overall direction of heritage, but obviously that's a very significant part of what you're doing. My yeah. follow-up question tells you what the first one is, which is yeah. Project 2025, because I look forward to the day when on January 20th, 2025, whoever the next president is, whoever he or she is, pretty optimistic that they'll be more conservative than our current president. We wish him long and healthy retirement as ex-president, that when he or she takes the oath of office, they will know that the full weight of the entire political right in America is behind him or her, that we not only have the policy ideas, the policy solutions, by that I mean the bills that he or she needs to push through Congress with their allies, the executive orders to implement, the, the rules, you know, going back to the administrative state conversation we were having, that they must implement to undo the excesses of the radical left. But most importantly, they also know that there are several thousand Americans who have come to D.C. to tithe two or four or six or let's hope eight years or more to restoring self-governance to the American people. That's what I spend the plurality of my time on. But the second thing, and it's very related to that, Jan, and I have to some extent helped Heritage reorient itself to be more active at the state level, is being focused on federalism. In order for the next conservative president to be successful in terms of policy, he or she has to have a sort of bubbling up of ideas from the states. We can't rely on the folks in this building behind me in the Capitol to do that yet. But given in 2023, as we sit here, that it's already the most successful legislative sessions ever for conservative policy, there are a lot of great policy ideas bubbling up from the state. So I'm very focused on that. And then the third and final thing in terms of my priorities and priorities for heritage is to take a step back from the political and policy landscape, take a step back from the frustrations we have about the two-tiered system of justice, take a step back from the daily news, and remember what's special about being an American. Remember the privileges we have to wake up here, whether we were born here or came here by choice. This is the greatest experiment in self-governance in history. And the Heritage Foundation is aptly named. We honor the heritage of the United States, not just with good policy, but by reminding all of our fellow Americans on the left, on the right, in the center, what it means to be an American, and that is to live in self-governance so that we can live the good life. Well, Kevin Roberts, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. It's always a pleasure to be here and look forward to more. Thank you all for joining Kevin Roberts and me on this episode of American Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Yanya Kalik.